Why do I look like a fake person? Hello, welcome to my video. Intel, ASML, Frito-Lays, AMD, Global Foundries, IBM, ASM, Pringles. Some of the world's most technologically advanced and profitable companies are in the chip making business. Disclaimer for this video, English is not my mother tongue. I will be butchering the distinction between the SH and CH sound. So at no point during this video will I be talking about naval vessels, only computer chips. Thank you. I grew up gaming on PC, so I have fond memories of being excited to get a Pentium 3 500 megahertz CPU so I could finally play my pirated version of GTA 3 while I was in high school in Honduras. I remember our PCs heating up our gaming room when I was playing EVE Online with my brother. Fast forward to today, everything is smart, Wi-Fi enabled, and on the cloud. The internet of things is, well, a thing. Cars, TVs, kitchen appliances, phones, thermostats, watches, doorbells, ovens are all now packed with computer chips. Along with the rise of smart devices, machine learning is becoming more and more widespread in its use, requiring more and more models be trained for different industrial, commercial, or artistic needs. Everything lives in the, on the cloud, which requires massive specialized server farms with top-tier expensive server chips. In short, we are all using more and more computer chips, far more than just a few decades ago, even years ago. <clears throat> Back at the time when cars didn't have onboard computers and couldn't drive themselves. We live in an era with tons of technological wonders and large scale scientific projects, such as LIGO, the Mars rovers, CERN, self-landing rocket boosters, self-driving cars, the James Webb Space Telescope, Starlink, and so many more. All this is possible in part because of the little old computer chip. So what are computer chips and what makes them so special of a tool that we use them every day? Modern computer chips are logical units that can take an input, execute code, and then produce an output. Computer chips are the successor to vacuum tubes, which were used on the first computers in the 50s and 60s. Chips use transistors to store values of one and zero and they are organized around what we call von Neumann architecture, named after mathematician John von Neumann. This means that each processing unit will have a logic control and memory unit. They are pretty small and made with techniques that create features and architectures measured in nanometers, hundreds of times smaller than the wavelength of light. The wavelength of light for comparison runs between 300 and 700 nanometers. In all, a computer chip would take two to four months to make and require very specialized facilities called clean rooms or fabs and their construction and staffing will run into tens of billions of dollars. Okay, so now that we've gone into what a computer chip is, let's take a quick overview of how they are made. Like I mentioned, the fundamental part of a computer chip is a transistor, which stores values as a zero or a one. Today's chips will have billions of transistors in areas smaller than a centimeter squared. Due to their need to reliably mass manufacture huge array of tiny structures, chips are manufactured on the surface of crystalline silicon wafers. These wafers are grown uh, as perfect crystals so they provide a perfect template on which to start building nanoscale devices such as transistors. Chips are made in fabs, which stands for fabrication sites, which really just means large clean room factories. One of the main challenges in making computer chips is that since their features are so small, a particle of dust, hair, a dead skin cell can destroy a chip during the manufacturing process. So because of this, they are manufactured in a clean environment or an environment where there is no dust particles in the air that can fall on a wafer as it's going through the production line. Fabs or clean rooms can even be more sterile than a surgery room because there's simply no biological mass to grow bacteria or any other form of life in there. A strand of hair can be tens of microns across, much larger than a transistor or metal interconnect in a computer chip. So if it falls on top of a wafer while it's processing, it can create defects that will shut down and destroy the functionality of a computer chip. 
Due to the dustless, clean environment of the fabs, personnel are required to undergo specific training and wear specialized outfits nicknamed bunny suits. Bunny suits are Gore-Tex overalls, booties, and gowns that are used so that when someone enters the clean room, all the particles of dust that they might be carrying doesn't contaminate the clean room. Bunny suits aren't meant to protect the user from the environment, but rather protect the environment from the user. Bunny suits catch dead skin cell or any other particles that an individual might drag into the clean room. And different, and different clean rooms will have different levels of sensitivity and therefore use different types of bunny suits, some being more stringent than others. Fabs use a variety of methods to keep the air dustless. Filters, strict control of personnel that can enter, um, sealed walls to make sure that there's no um, wind coming in, require that anything brought into the fab be wiped down with isopropyl alcohol to remove any dust particles from any objects, laminar airflow from the top of the fab to the bottom of the fab to make sure all dust that does make it in is pushed down to the floor, and maintaining a positive pressure compared to the external environment, meaning that there is a constant airflow from inside the fab, which is at a higher pressure, to outside of the fab. If nothing else though, breeze is pretty refreshing on a hot summer day. So in short, ships are elegant small devices made of billions of transistors made in very specialized and expensive factories. Okay, so now that we've kind of had an overview of what computer chips are, let's talk a little bit about their manufacturing uh, process. So there's three phases. First is front end of the line. This is the phase where transistors are printed onto the surface of the wafer. Like, like we mentioned, transistors are made with, with different resolutions, all very small, from micron for the leading edge technologies, down to the current generation measured in four to 10 nanometers for what's called the bleeding edge of technology. And while there is some difference in how resolutions are defined between companies and technologies, broadly speaking, the smaller the resolution of a chip, the more advanced the manufacturing process is. The tra these transistors are made through a repeating loop of printing lithography patterns on the wafer, coating it with a material and then selectively etching it off, effectively transferring patterns on top of the wafer. This is repeated thousands of times so the final chip will have thousands of layers on them. Once the transistors are manufactured in the front end of the line, we move on to the back end of the line. So in the first part we manufacture the transistors, in this part we connect them with copper interconnects. So basically this is where we're making the circuits and connecting the transistors to each other to make logic units. After these two phases, which can take months, is completed, the, ch the chip then needs to be embedded in a substrate and packaged into what we will see or know of as a computer chip or a CPU. So this is the external shell that provides the physical support and the connections for when the chip is embedded in a motherboard or a circuit board. Okay. So now that we've gone over how a chip is made, let's go into what are the factors that make it difficult to increase supply. I will be breaking these down to two different broad categories, geography and cost. So fabs are huge sites that have very specific requirements as to where they can be built. First of all, the environment. Like I said, large, expensive, so they have to be built somewhere safe and politically stable. Flooding, tornadoes, or other natural disasters could potentially damage or destroy billions of dollars of worth of equipment. Equipment in the fabs can be very sensitive to external disturbances like seismic events or earthquakes occurring hundreds of miles away, which can take down a lithography stepper with the slightest motion of the earth. Fabs will need tons of parts and supplies from different parts of the world, so they need to be close or have access to world-class road networks, airports, and ports to bring in all the chemicals, equipment, parts, and spares needed to keep the factory running. Fabs require thousands of qualified and experienced technicians and engineers to run, so it might be best to set up near a, a university. Along with the technical personnel, you will need an even greater number of employees in support roles such as security, legal, finance, HR, logistics, custodial, security, and etc. Your fab will use up a lot of power and water, so these sites are never set up without checking in with the local municipal, city, or state government. 
they will have to work with local utilities to make sure that they can draw enough water and power and have a stable supply to make sure that everything can run smoothly. These technologies are very valuable to make military weapons and equipment. So countries control very closely where companies that make chips can set up and do business. Western countries regularly limit what technologies can be exported to global rivals to prevent them from catching up when it comes to chip manufacturing technologies. An example of this is that there has been reports from Russia's invasion of Ukraine where Russian military hardware has been found with parts that have been stripped out of dishwashers and laundry machines, since presumably the Russian military forces weren't able to get proper replacements. Okay, moving on to the second group of factors why we, it's so difficult to increase, increase chip supply is cost and equipment. Dry edge vacuum chambers cost tens of millions of dollars. Lithography steppers cost hundreds of millions of dollars along with the vendor contracts to get support and knowledge to run and operate the equipment correctly. Fabs will have dozens of each types of machines filling up these massive fabs. So in the end, the cost of filling a fab with the equipment needed to make microchips will run into billions of dollars. All right, so let's say you set up your fab and you have your technical personnel. So now you need offices for them to work in. Uh, factory personnel will probably need lockers and rest areas as well. Well, now you probably need a cafe because there's so many people there. It's an industrial factory site, so you will need medical and safety personnel. To stay competitive, you need modern amenities like gyms, on-site doctors, dentists, outdoor green areas, and so forth. Since it's an industrial operation, you'll need logistics and supply departments to ensure a timely flow of chemicals, fluids, spares, parts, along with on-site storage and warehouses. In addition to all this, you will also need HR, finance, and legal departments. With all these people, you'll need a security office to keep the area safe and contained. Oh, but now you're using so much water, you might have to get a treatment plant. To help cut down carbon emissions, you might need solar panel arrays. You will also want to make sure your vendors and contractors are nearby, so they may also want office space on site. Now that your fab is so large and expensive, it only makes sense in terms of cost to run if it's running 24 seven. So now you also need a night shift equivalent for all your day shift rows. So in the end, these sites end up being like small cities onto themselves, directly employing tens of thousands of employees and far more people indirectly. And fabs being set up nearby can have huge effects on the local economy, cost of living and property values over the years. Nevertheless, even with tax breaks, fabs represent massive and risky financial investments, running the risk of misjudging demand and having excess capacity you don't need. Such is the case of Intel's Fab 42, which stood idle for nearly a decade until demand increased again, cost the company billions of dollars as the building sat empty. That requires an extremely large amount of capital that very few governments or businesses can muster. So we've talked about the supply side of things, so now let's move on to demand. So the first big one I think everybody is aware of, the pandemic changed so much for so many. One of the biggest transitions for a lot of people was moving to working from home. This means a lot of people need to buy more computers, laptops, monitors to set up their home offices. Since people were spending so much time at home with social distancing, lots of people also bought new game consoles, TVs, exercise equipment and so forth, all of which drove up demand. Another factor is apps and the cloud. Kind of like what I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we live in the digital world and all our cloud-based apps need to run somewhere. All the AI models and services that Google, Amazon, Snap, Meta, and others use have to run on server farms. The need for more and more internet computing power means more server farms and consequently more chips need to be dedicated to powering the internet. We, all, we also live and work in an increasingly automated economy Business, industry, agriculture, and all parts of the economy use robotics, cloud technology, or AI more and more for their day-to-day -day operations. All this modernization and upgrades means they will be needing more computer chips to keep everything running. So all these factors basically just means that we need more chips for each person to have everything that they're used to. There is one more tragic factor that I think will be affecting the chip shortage in the near future, and that is Russia's cruel invasion of Ukraine. Russia, being a, a former superpower, is fueling huge amounts of equipment. 
on the other side, Ukraine is being equipped more and more by NATO and getting more advanced equipment, such as GPS systems, guided missiles, night vision goggles, drones, guided artillery shells, jets, tanks, APCs, javelins, manpads, HIMARS, etc. All of these extensively use electronic components made with chips in them. This combined means that a very large amount of military equipment is being used and destroyed in the war. In time, this equipment will have to be replaced, be it by NATO, Ukraine, or Russia, meaning that they will need a lot of chips to replace destroyed equipment. Other than equipment being destroyed, along with the horrific loss of life, this war is an ugly wake-up call to a lot of nations. That war on this scale using modern equipment is still a very real possibility. Armies across the world are going to be diverting more and more resources to their militaries, buying and upgrading equipment. And all this will lead to a global increase in demand for chips. The chip shortage has been with us for a few years. Governments around the world have mobilized to funnel more resources to create greater domestic manufacturing capabilities. But it will take a few more years before fabs are online. The US just signed into law the Chips and Science Act. The EU passed the EU Chips Act. Russia and China are racing to further develop their domestic chip manufacturing capabilities. TSMC is also spending billions to, on expanding their production capabilities. In summary, all the world powers realize the need to have robust domestic production for computer chips. Modern society cannot run as we know it without a steady supply of computer chips. We don't know what the future brings, but we can expect the chip shortage to continue for now. Fortunately, we are seeing signs that the worst is easing as supply lines and global manufacturing adjust to a post-COVID world. Well, that's all I had for you today. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like this type of content. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Take care and thank you very much. Have a good one.